All right, our next speaker will be talking about the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, Virginia Lorenz uh, is our speaker. She's from the Department of Physics and Astronomy. She earned her PhD at the University of Colorado Boulder, a home institution of one of the prize winners. Um, and then she did postdoctoral research at uh, the University of Oxford before coming to the University of Delaware in September 2009. Her research involves experimental studies of the interaction of light with matter at the atomic and photon scale using ultra short, short laser pulses of, and um, high, high temperature atomic gases and atomic fibers. There you are, you're behind me on the other side. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So the Nobel Prize this year went to Serge Haroche at the Collège de France in Paris and David Wineland at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado. Um, so these two men have very similar trajectories in terms of their um, careers. Serge Haroche uh, got his PhD studying the interaction between light and matter under the supervision of a future Nobel laureate, Claude cohen Tanuji, who got the Nobel Prize in 1997. He then continued on in uh, the same research uh, area, developing new methods for uh, laser uh, probing of matter. And then in the 1970s, he did a, a postdoctoral uh, research with uh, Arthur Shallow, who also got the Nobel Prize in 1981. He then landed at uh, Paris 6 University in, in France, and that's where he performed the majority of his work related to the Nobel Prize. And then he had various other appointments later on, including head of the physics department and administrator of the Collège de France. Wineland had a very similar trajectory. Uh, he started with his bachelor's degree from Berkeley. He then went on to get a PhD um, under also a Nobel laureate, uh, Norman Foster Ramsey, who got the Nobel Prize in 1989. Uh, he then did postdoctoral research also under a future Nobel laureate, Hans Demelt's group. And then um, he landed at the National Bureau of Standards, uh, which is now called the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder. And that's where he performed the majority of his work. So both of them had um, mentoring uh, by future Nobel laureates. The uh, Nobel Committee cited their groundbreaking experimental methods that enable measuring and manipulation of individual quantum systems. So I'd like to talk briefly what is meant by quantum systems. So uh, the two types of experiments that Horosh and Weinland did can be divided into two aspects of the world as we know it, light and matter. Light is exactly what you imagine it is. It's the light emanating from the bulbs that are above us. And this light impinges on matter and interacts with matter and reflects off of it and gives us the colors that we see in the room. So light and matter couple together. And when you think about the fundamental nature of light, if you were to dim these lights in the room to the point where you can barely see any light at all, you'd find that instead of dimming continuously, it actually dim starts to dim in little packets of energy. And those packets of energy are what we call photons. So photons are the quantum systems of light. Oops. Uh, on the matter side, if you do the same thing, focus in with a, a microscope to a very, very uh, uh, close level, you find that the quantum systems of matter are atoms. It doesn't respond. There we go. Sorry. Okay, great. So um, light interacts with matter, and at the quantum scale, we're talking about photons interacting with atoms. Hiroshi and Weinland did two complementary uh, experiments. On the one hand, Hiroshi trapped photons and probed whether a photon was present or not using atoms. On the other hand, Wineland trapped atoms and then used photons to probe the state of the atom. And both of them were able to do this probing, were able to test uh, and measure the system without destroying it. And this was quite a feat, which is what I'm going to describe. Right, so let's start with Hiroshi's work. 
he probed photons using atoms. So you want to study a single photon, or you want, you want to somehow um, measure a photon. First of all, you need to have a way of trapping photons. So every, every morning when you wake up, you look in the mirror, and you actually see photons bouncing back at you. So the photons are coming from the lights, reflecting off your face, and then reflecting off the mirror back into your eye. And the various colors you see represent the various interactions that that photon has experienced uh, as it bounced off atoms on your face and on the mirror. So the question is, how do you trap such a photon? Well, when you look in the mirror, the photon just bounces off and, and it goes away. It goes into your eye. And in your eye, it's absorbed by the receptors in your eye. And the photon is destroyed. So to trap a photon, you might think, well, maybe I can make kind of a hall of mirrors for the photon. If I had another mirror, and I balanced them just right, then I could end up with a photon bouncing back and forth and being trapped between the two mirrors. And this is the basic idea behind trapping a photon. So what Hiroshi and his colleagues did is they built very, very reflective mirrors using very uh, advanced materials, uh, superconducting uh, niobium-coated mirrors. So you can see in the reflection here, it's kind of an odd reflection. It's a bit distorted, and that's because they curved the mirrors, because curved mirrors are more efficient at trapping photons. So they were very good at trapping photons using this, uh, what they call a cavity. Uh, inside, the photons were able to travel a distance equivalent to a round trip to the moon before disappearing. So this is a very, very good mirror. Okay. Right. So now that they trapped... Oh, so this is showing... Uh, them assembling the, the cavity. You can see ha uh, one half of the cavity is being lowered onto the other half here. Right. So they've trapped a photon. Now the question is, how do you measure the presence of a photon without destroying it? So as I said, if you were just to open the cavity and let the light, for example, enter your eye, it would be absorbed by the receptors in your eye. It would be converted from photon energy to some other type of energy. So how do you test the presence of a photon without destroying it? Well, one common method in the laboratory, and this is what we also do in my lab, is we detect a photon by uh, measuring the current it produces when it strikes a semiconducting material. So what happens in this process is the photon energy is converted to electron energy. So one idea might be, uh, if you just want to detect the photon, that you have the photon in the cavity here. Um, and then you allow one of the cavity mirrors to slightly tr be transmitting, uh, uh, not, not perfectly reflective. So what happens then is the photon can, can be released from the uh, cavity, and then the detector can tell you that there is a photon in the cavity. The problem, of course, is the photon's gone. So again, you've destroyed the photon. And this was the technique that people used to measure whether a photon is present. But there's a, the fact that you lose the photon is a big problem. So how do you go about actually testing whether the photon's there without destroying it? This is actually what Hirosh did. So instead of allowing the cavity to transmit a photon and detect it and destroy the photon, they took a very specialized type of atom that's called a Rydberg atom. And that's what's uh, depicted here. The Rydberg atom corresponds to having, so uh, atoms have electrons and they have a nucleus, and the nucleus orbit around the, elect, uh, the nucleus, sorry, the electrons orbit around the nucleus. And you can see here, this uh, ring here represents the electron cloud of the atom. So the electrons are in a very highly uh, excited state that looks a little bit like a donut. And the reason that they put the atom in this state is it makes it very sensitive to the presence of a photon, but it doesn't actually absorb a photon. So when it passes through the cavity here, it won't absorb the photon, but its, its phase will be changed. So a, a property of the atomic state will change as it passes through the cavity. And then, instead of looking at the photon to see whether it's there, you look at the atom to, to see how it's changed. And if it's changed a certain way, you then can tell that a photon was present in the cavity. So this was a non-destructive measurement of the presence of a photon. And this is what Horosh did. Right. So what did Weinland do? He was on the opposite side of the coin. He, he was uh, studying atoms using photons. So the question is the same. Um, how do you trap an atom? So uh, the, the method um, 
that's typically used is uh, you actually choose an atom that is missing an electron. And this is what we call an ion. It's a charged atom. And a charge interacts with electric fields. So by using electric fields in a very special configuration, you can actually trap an ion in the middle. And this is equivalent uh, to having uh, um, something like a bowl around a ball. The ball is trapped at the bottom of the bowl. It's a very similar type of interaction, except here you're using indiv invisible electric fields to trap a charged atom. So this is uh, actually what they did uh, with one extra addition, which is they added lasers in order to remove all of the vibrations that the atom was experiencing. So the atom was very, very still at the bottom of that uh, well. And this is a photo of the cavity here. So the ions could stay trapped in, in, their, uh, in their ion trap for six months or longer, which is quite amazing. And this is a photo of uh, Wyland uh, adjusting the ion trap. Now, this is the region of the ion trap, but actually you can see there's a lot more going on here. And that's the case for both of these experimentalists. There were many technical hurdles that they needed to overcome, many new technologies that they used in order to make this happen. OK, so just as we did with a, a photon, um, once you've trapped it, how do you measure it? The same question applies for an atom. So once you've trapped the atom, how do you me measure the state of the atom without changing that state? So a common method is to determine the atom's state by shining a laser on it. What the laser does is it causes the atom to enter a different type of state and then emit a photon. Okay? And when it emits a photon, you can use a detector similar to the one we used before to detect the photon. In this case, you can imagine, well, you're going to destroy the photon, but what about the atom? What happens to the atom when you interact with a laser? So what I've depicted here is our trapped atom, and we have a detector here ready to receive whatever photon it might emit. Right now, the atom is red. That represents the color that it would absorb, for example. To test what the state of the atom is, what color it is, we can shine a laser on it. And that's going to allow the atom to get excited and then emit a photon. But when it does this, the state of the atom changes. That's represented by the green color. So the, atom, the electron in the atom is in a different state. And so the atom um, is no longer the same. So this ruins the original state of the atom. So how do you do this? How do you probe the state of an atom without changing that state? So the idea that Wineland and his colleagues uh, did was to couple the motion of the ion with its internal state or its color. So they have this trapped ion. And what they did is, with lasers, they could actually cause the ion to vibrate in very particular modes, vibrational modes. So in this case, for example, let's consider a red ion moving side to side. So now we can describe the state of the ion as red plus side to side motion. And this helps us if we introduce a second ion. So the idea is we can add a second one. And because the two ions interact with one another, it'll end up in the same vibrational mode. This vibrational mode is also coupled to the internal state of that atom. And this allows us then to make a measurement on the second atom without affecting the first. So here we can set a laser pulse on the second atom. It will change and emit light that we can detect. And the color of the light tells us what the color of the atom was. And although we've destroyed this atom's state, this one still remains intact. So we've gained information about this quantum state without destroying it. So what, all, what is this good for? What, what is this all uh, um, uh, interesting for? Well, one application is quantum computing. So uh, the ions that were used in the last, uh, last slide um, can have different internal states or colors. And these colors can then be assigned a number. So you can say blue is 0, red is 1. And these can serve as bits in a computer. So a computer uses strings of bits to represent data. So you can imagine taking these ions and using them as carriers of information. But there's one additional aspect of quantum systems that I, I haven't mentioned, and that is quantum systems can actually be in two states at once. 
So this is the strange nature of quantum mechanics that allows the state of a, a quantum particle to actually exist in what we call a superposition, or a combination of two different states. And that's represented by this atom, which has two colors. And it mathematically can be represented as a zero plus a one. Now, because the atom is in a superposition that allows us to do new mathematical algorithms that simply aren't possible with a regular computer that we use today. So what this could do is actually revolutionize computing as we know it by allowing faster factoring of numbers and also allowing us to simulate systems that act quantum mechanically um, in timescales that are relatively short compared to what an everyday computer nowadays could do. Another application is um, in very precise timekeeping. So the color of an ion is very pure. That means that its frequency can be measured extremely well. So this represents a photon emitted by an ion, and it has a particular wavelength associated with it. And if we think about that in terms of time, we can measure the oscillations in time. And if we started a, a particular time by measuring those oscillations and knowing the frequency very well, we can then have a very precise measure of time. Why is this important? Well, actually, many of the car navigation systems and cell phones require global positioning systems. And these types of systems really require a very accurate uh, measure of time. So these allow us to uh, uh, very accurately navigate uh, over large length scales. All right. So to conclude, uh, Weinland and Haroche invented and implemented new technologies that allowed the measurement and control of quantum systems without destroying them and with high accuracy. So their work enabled some uh, further experiments that probed the fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics and also gave us the first steps toward the quantum computer and um, the development of extremely accurate optical clocks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Quantum physics is usually a real crowd pleaser. You know, I, having taught it many years myself, uh, I felt that uh, it was a good way to really bring many conversations to an end quite quickly. Uh, <laughs> But um, you know, you, when you talked about these pairs of atoms that were trapped together, how physically close are those atoms to one another? Um, I think they're probably uh, tens of nanometers, I would guess. So very long compared to the size of yes, the atom itself. Yes, very yeah. long, yes. And, and are those typically, these experiments are really done with just one or two atoms in the trap, or is it a larger aggregation of so atoms? So initially, um, it was hard enough to just do two, but now they've done um, algorithms, actually quantum computing algorithms, using up to 14 uh, trapped ions. And I think that's about where the limit stands right now. So how do, how do, the, how do they, when you get 14 atoms together in a trap, they probably don't just all lie in a long line. Do you know how they, how they order themselves? Are they like clumped together into a, a big <laughs> atomic ball? Yeah, it's a good right? question. I think initially they had to control them with lasers to very precisely um, put them in position. And then the uh, lasers also give them a kick, so they have a vibrational mode. And they actually have videos online where you can see the ions kind of doing spreading motions or, or translational motions. So they really um, provide the initial kick with a laser that gives these motions uh, a good start. So. Are those the questions? Yes, sir. Can you give some order of Mm -hmm. so, um, so in terms of factoring large numbers, I think you get uh, polynomial scaling improvements. Um, in terms of quantum uh, so using um, optical clocks, they've been able to show using this optical transition in ions um, an accuracy down to 10 to the minus 17 uh, seconds. So very, very accurate timing. Anything else? All right, thank you very much, Gina.